are pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. I am absolutely delighted to welcome to Bite Size Book Chats, uh, one of the preeminent book bloggers out there in the blogosphere, Nancy from the Metro Detroit area, whose blog has been going strong since 2008, The Literate Quilter. Welcome, Nancy. Hello. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I've been following your blog and your tweets about your blog for quite some time. So the book, this is the first time that I've featured a nonfiction book about kind of ecological environmental issues, and it sounds so interesting. It is called The Accidental Reef and Other Ecological Odysseys in the Great Lakes by Lynn Heasley, and it was just published, I believe, this month, August. It was just published, yes. Yeah. And you wrote a really fantastic, very detailed blog entry, which I'm going to put a link, of course, to your blog, The Literate Quilter, but also to this specific blog entry and your Goodreads and maybe some other stuff. But in kind of a synopsis kind of way, what, what is this book about? The book is about the Great Lakes as a whole and the environmental challenges being faced by the whole water system. Looking at it the problems, particularly through the St. Clair River. The St. Clair River goes between Lake Huron down to Cass Lake through the Detroit River into Lake Erie. All the water from Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, and Lake Huron come through the St. Clair River. The St. Clair River is also one of the older in Michigan um, developed uh, industrial sites. So we had lumbering there, we had paper making, there were salt mines. And because of the salt mines, you have chemical alley, particularly in Sarnia, Canada. Yes. So there's a huge amount of environmental impact from um, human uh, industry, but also the St. Clair River had originally been a very marshy and those marshes were cleared up. So what naturally cleaned the drainage from the land is gone. So it, it, I was particularly interested to read this book because I, I've lived in the Great Lakes most of my life and I, I wanted to know more about the St. Clair River and the environmental impact there. The author has done a really interesting job. She, her writing style has a character to it. That's what I keep uh, seeing and, in the reviews, yeah. Yeah, so it's not boring. It's not a dull fact-driven. She also comes at the issue several different ways. One of the ways is she looks deeply at the work of a diver who dives into St. Clair River for various reasons. And he's done a lot of filmology. He's done things for National Geographic and everything. And looking at his deep knowledge of what's down there. One of the things that was discovered is that sometime a long time ago, a ship cleaned out its furnace and threw clinkers, coal clinkers into the river and it created a six foot deep reef, an artificial reef, she that's calls the it. Title, yeah. And that's the title. And oddly, this reef has become a, a real boon to the native species, particularly the sturgeon, which is a 50 million year old fish that people thought were pretty much fished out. And this artificial reef is the perfect place for sturgeon to breed. So she looks at how species adapt to what we've done as well. So it seems like it's really balanced. And I don't mean that it lets uh, human beings off the hook, but it shows no. the resourcefulness. In spite of all the terrible things we've done, just the, the uh, vitality and uh, resilience of, of so many yes, of the natural yes, species yes. in the uh, lake. And I hear that the uh, illustrations are fabulous too. Yes, they are. There, there's some very lovely illustrations. So it's, Photographs or drawing? No, it's art, artwork. Artwork. artwork Glenn yeah. Wolf is the illustrator. In addition to some of the, th the things you said, I see that the, the synopsis mentions, well, you said scuba divers and scientists, toxic pollutants, threatened communities, oil pipelines, and invasive species. And, yes. and there's quite a bit about the indigenous peoples that 
that yes. lives in the area. Yes, it's, it, it's not a very huge book, but she covers it all. She talks about how the invasive species have come to the Great Lakes. She talks about the Enbridge pipelines and other pipelines. There's something like 21 pipelines that go under the St. Clair River. And so there's all these environmental risks and, and she discusses all those. And yes, the indigenous Indians, the natives relied on fishing. And now the fish that some of them have completely disappeared and some of them are not safe to eat. For instance, walleye. Walleye is a very tasty fish. I don't know if I've ever had it, but I saw you said you wrote in your blog review that uh, what's the, the current recommendation? Eight. Eight, 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 eight meals a, a year. You shouldn't eat more than eight walleye a year because of the PCP and other pollutants in the flush. So what in effect has been done is that the native species has been poisoned for human use. And that is very important to the Native Americans who, who you know, counted on fishery as, as a sustenance. I'm just developing a, kind of a grown-up interest in these kinds of issues and starting to incorporate nonfiction reading about the environment. I grew up in Saskatchewan in Canada, which is in the prairies, and uh, I'm just starting to read natural history or natural and all indigenous history, the overlap between indigenous history and natural history in my area, and uh, starting to spread my interest out. So this really sounds intriguing, and especially because you have said that You've written in your review and you've said tonight, it's not written in some kind of academic style. Yes. It's yeah. very accessible. There's a lot of information in there, but it's, it's, it's entertaining. It's, and she gets a little experimental. Uh -huh. She has something called this Harper Index, where you list a number of things. So she'll start out, let's look at sand. She'll start out and tell you how many grains of sand that there are in the world. And, and she gets all these facts and then they come through how we've used sand, how we've carted away entire sand dunes and what happens to it. And it builds a picture. Um, and some people might say, well, that's boring, but it's, it was very interesting. It was a, a new way of looking at things. I think this is the kind of thing that anybody who is a little bit uh, sitting on the fence about it should go and get a preview, Kindle preview or whatever, because uh, it sounds like the writing is what's going to draw people in that might not otherwise be yeah, a bit, yeah. uh, shy about it. This sounds great. I highly recommend people go check out your blog, The Literate Quilter. What, are, what kind of quilt are you working on now? Um, well, right now I've just finished my light, Michigan Lighthouse quilt top. Uh, patterns I collected for quite a few years. Fusible applique with machine work. Quilt top is together. It's got the Mackinac Bridge in the center. Now I have to machine quilt it. So that's, that's one of the things I'm working on now. That's fabulous. I have a, a student in one of my English classes that I teach here in Japan, in Tokyo, that she is a quilter and she teaches quilting here in Tokyo. So oh. um, Nancy is- the Japanese are fantastic quilters. Are they? Well, yes, they are amazing. Quilters look great. Would you be willing to supply me with a photo of your most recent quilt that I can put right into the video? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, great. That's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> and uh, everybody, go check out Nancy's blog and her her Goodreads and everything else. And Nancy, I want to sign a contract with you that you'll come back often. <laughs> oh, thank you. This was your first Zoom appearance thank on BookTube, so and you're a natural, so thank you so much. So uh, this is my first repeat guest. Welcome back, yeah. Loison thank from you. India. And thank you. Great. So I invited you back this quickly because you recently finished another novel that looks so interesting. I don't know. I didn't know anything about it, but it is called Bombay Baltao by yes, Dane yes. Borges. Dane Borges, yes. Tell us about it. It's about a Goan community that is settled in Mumbai. A street name, D. Lima Street in Kavel. That's the place name. Right. So it's the Goan settlers that are living there, uh, their life about their stories, how they are getting their life, so how they are moving in the, and uh, mingling with the Mumbai cars. Mumbai cars is a local name that we call for all the people in Mumbai, Mumbai cars. 
I didn't know anything about Goa or anything, so I've just looked it up. So correct me if I say anything wrong, but okay, Goa okay. used to be a Portuguese colony. Yes, in the past it was. Till quite recently, like 1947. Uh, At the time of independence, Indian independence. Right. I didn't know anything about that. And so when you say Goa, and these are people that used to live in Portuguese Goa or this now yes, yes. state of Goa, and they came to Mumbai. Yes, actually, for, uh, in Goan lifestyle, we can see Portuguese influence. Today, today also, they are continuing that influence, their culture. Everything is related to Portuguese because at the time of independence, Goa was under the control of Portuguese. It was a colony of Portuguese. Right. So their influence was heavy in their culture, food, their dressing style. Everything was well influenced by Portuguese cultures. Right. So Goans are happy to exp uh, express that culture. Their dressing style is very different, but different according to Indians, but uh, much related to Portuguese. Also, their food food delicacies are also related to Portuguese. And the title is Bao Chao, and that is a Goan dish. What is fish, Bao fish. Chao? Bao Chao. It's a fish, fish dish. Very, quite spicy. Ah, yeah, somewhat spicy. Yeah. Have you uh, tried it? No, 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 no. I haven't. It sounds good. And uh, yes. Jake Orgus is a journalist and she comes from uh, this neighborhood, right? Yes. And But this mm -hmm. is her first novel. Ah, uh, yeah. Bombay Vulture is her debut, yeah. debut novel. There are a lot of characters in this book. Yeah. Uh, it's taking place from 1940s to 2015, I think. Right. That's the, the years that is depicted in this book, according to the characters, their view of life, the situations they are uh, going through their life. And the world novel is depicting about this D. Lima street in Kavel. Kavel is a place in Mumbai mm -hmm. and it feels so, so, so related to our heart. Mm. And the uh, writing is also good. Yeah. And it's told in the form of short stories that are interconnected. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, different short stories like, uh, but when you're viewing totally, they are totally interconnected and for, like a like a river, they are interconnected. The flow is also good. That's great, and the uh, characters are uh, quite colorful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, colorful and much related. It's a story. It is a story of some characters, what they are doing, how they are sur surviving in Mumbai, with their identity as Goan settlers, Goan migrants how the developing Mumbai is affecting them, how they are tackling that development. Because at the later stage in this, uh, in this novel, the developing Mumbai is trying to carve their lifestyle. They trying to, trying to remove them from their homes. Oh. Uh, so for the development, they are trying to demolish their building. So oh. what they are doing against this, Against that is described well. Uh, that is at the later stage of the story, at the end portion. So the neighborhood comes under threat from the yes, government. from the authorities. Yes, wow, it has a beautiful cover. Yeah, cover is also good. That is a flat that they are living in. The two buildings, each floor is each room. They are living as a tenant from the period of their settlement, uh, from their grandfathers, fathers, and now our characters are living in that same room. Same house. And uh, there's some co comic or funny moments as well. Yeah, there is yeah. some funny moments. Yeah, and serious, uh -huh. more serious moments. And Yes, serious. Everything is included. Seriousness, funny, love, everything. The yeah, synopsis says it's a tangled tale of ordinary lives. Yes, how their lifestyle, uh, the issues they are facing, the... Sentiment and sentiments and emotions they are showing towards each other. Well, it sounds great. And thank you for telling us about it, Loison. Actually, you should read it. It will make you happy. It will make you smile. It will make you to think about what, what is happening here, how they are doing their life. And I, I think it's going to make me hungry too, Loison. <laughs> yeah, somewhat, maybe. Because if you are not sure about the cuisines in India, actually, it will make you to lick something in your tongue. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Loison. Okay, fine. Thank you, thank you. Pleasure is mine. So, Chiera from Dublin, welcome to Bite Size Book Chats. Hi, Sean. Thank you for having me.
Nice to meet you. And I am dying to talk to you about this novel. When I saw that you'd read it, I decided I wanted to invite you. And the novel is Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Cooper Smith. And just published uh, a month ago, I believe. And you were one of the very first readers. So what I understand about it is that the author, Violet Cooper Smith, is mixed race, uh, uh, half, maybe half, I don't know about half, but Vietnamese and something else. And this is a somewhat, so parts of this story are quite autobiographical. And I want you to tell us some of the rest of it. Sure. It's autobiographical because Valerie Cooper Smith is uh, Vietnamese American. And we actually do see that uh, one character is also Vietnamese American. She goes to Vietnam to find uh, herself. It is a quirky, quite complex uh, novel. And it comes through as a sort of pastiche. It is a detective story because we're dealing with the disappearance of uh, uh, two women years apart. So we really need to find out uh, uh, what happened and how are they related somehow? Why are they in the same novel? It is a post-colonial novel as well, because we are dealing with the legacy of the French occupation in uh, Vietnam. It is a feminist novel because we are dealing with violence on women and uh, a ghost story because we have all sorts of uh, magic or supernatural elements also from Vietnamese folklore. And it's also a satirical novel because these elements are really represented in the most fantastic way. Wow. And there's so many things in what you've said are, that are things that I don't like. I don't like detective stories. I don't like magical realism. I don't like ghosts, although I'm getting over the ghost allergy. But there's many of those things. But yet this one, somehow, I am definitely going to try it. There's something so intriguing about it. You love the writing, didn't you? Exactly, yes. First of all, because uh, it is not uh, a true ghost story. I mean, we do see spirits uh, and ghosts, but they are described in such an hilarious and satirical way. For example, we have the Saigon Spirit Eradication Company. Just the name already tells you that uh, it's going to be a funny situation. And the fortune teller um, is uh, a soccer fan. And you cannot guess one single result of a soccer game. So, like, you know, his fortune telling abilities are really, you know, just not quite the, what they should be. Although, you know, just he's very good when we need him to be good. It sounds like there's some humor in it. It's very humorous, absolutely. Okay. Just in the way of describing things, for example, at a certain stage, we have a, a description of the traffic in Saigon, and we learned that there is, should be a mass grave underneath, and it's probably the ghosts <laughs> just hovering around and causing the traffic. Like, it's really, you know, just a, this two-dimensional uh, reality, and it comes to us as very, very funny in the way it's told, uh, very humorous. Okay, and, but not only humorous. No, it's not humorous. It is a very serious novel about uh, violence over women. You know, just this is really a very strong element. And the whole point, you know, just what uh, Cooper Smith really wanted to write was uh, a novel highlighting, you know, just women violence and uh, how women strike back. And, you know, this is what happens little by little in, in the novel, you know, how they can protect themselves. Right. So the re obviously people that don't want to read about violence against women, it's very central to the story. There's two women that disappear, one in 1986, a teenage daughter of a wealthy Vietnamese family, and the other one is in 2011, an, a young, unhappy Vietnamese American woman. They both disappear, and those stories are kind of threaded together with all of those other ele elements and literary tones that you have already told us about. It just sounds fascinating. It's really fascinating, yes, ah. because uh, novel is told in uh, different chapters with different times, and we really learn little by little. At the beginning, we're really clueless about the connection of the two women, but then little by little, we go into history and we really see how one gets to the other. Is there anything you didn't like about it? Not really. I really enjoyed it. Um, some scenes, the first horror scene that uh, I met, I really disliked it. It was a sort of exorcism. Uh, but uh, I have to say it was really the only one. And then it, you, you were kind of won over by the... What, yes, exactly. You know, it just doesn't really happen anymore. So it doesn't get that bad. And uh, also spirits are on the good side in this novel. So <laughs> it's not scary even because of that. When I'm looking at my friends' reviews, I'm seeing this, uh, things like enchanting, horrific, beautiful. Uh, WTF did I just read? <laughs> also. 
Yeah, That's and uh, your review, an impressive debut in a dark feminist literary thriller. Yeah. This just sounds so interesting. Did it remind you of anything else you've read? The magic realist component is really there. It reminded me a little bit of Milkman, but uh, Milkman is way more difficult. You know, this is actually easy. See, and I loved Milkman, so that makes me all the more excited. I was already sold, but I am now doubly sold, so thank you, Tiara. And goodness, I, your Goodreads is an endless source of fascination for me. You have such interesting taste in books, so um, I hope you will be a repeat guest. Thank you. It is my special pleasure to welcome to Bite Size Book Chats, Lexa from Kenya. Welcome, Lexa. Thank you so much for having me. It oh. really means a lot. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. I didn't know about Lexa's booktube channel until a few days ago. I learned about it the same day that I was making, well, I usually make a Friday Reads, but this particular weekend I made a Saturday Reads, and I just got a message pointing me to Lexa's channel, which is called Lexa Reads. I'll put a link, of course, in the show notes. So I got a chance to shout her out on my uh, weekend video and then contacted her to have her on Bite Size Book Chats because Alexa has organized a uh, Kenyan Readathon 2021. I think it's this is the second year that it's been on and I'm hoping to, I'm planning to participate, but I didn't know about it until Saturday. So this is great. So I've asked Alexa to come on and tell us about a Kenyan novel that she really likes and I am planning to read it, I hope, for the Kenyan Readathon. But before we get into the novel, tell us, give us your elevator pitch about the Readathon. Thank you so much for having me, Sean, on here. It really means a lot. And I was so, so happy when you gave me the shout out. I didn't even know about Amelia. I didn't even know about your channel. And thank you so much for, you know, letting me know that you'd given me a shout out. So, uh, the Kenyan Readathon, I initiated it last year. It runs for the whole month of September, where we only get to read Kenyan works. That is like poetry, short stories, novels, memoirs, anything that is on paper that is written by a Kenyan. And also we get to do some fun challenges, like uh, listening to our music, making our foods, and visiting other places in Kenya that have like historical, you know, uh, content and also learning other languages. So it's all about uh, celebrating our authors, those the classic ones like Ngugi and the recent ones, and, you know, just getting people to know more about our authors because Kenyans have great stories. <laughs> I was saying too much. No, yeah, 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 that's fantastic. Kenya has a rich literary culture. Yes. So uh, I'm so glad you're celebrating it. And mm -hmm. there's a lot more details in Lexa's announcement video. So I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes. And if you look at her, her show notes, she has a, there's a big document of recommended books. It's fantastic. So she has a whole bunch of resources because I'm not widely read in Kenyan literature, but I'm very interested in it. And I am delighted to take part and all of you watching this video, you should take part too, whether you are on booktube or not. So fantastic. And so the book that you are going to talk about today uh, for a bite-sized book chat is a 1976 novel by Meja Moengi, Going Down River Road. Tell us about it. There Did it you is. manage to get your copy? I will do, I can, the, the easiest way I can get it is on ebook, so I will read it on ebook. All right, so before we go to the title, I'd like to say something about the author. His real name is not Major. His real name is David Dominic Mwangi. So Major is like a pen name. So this is actually my favorite author. If anyone asks me anytime, I'll just say Major, or anyone here in Kenya who knows me knows I love Major Mwangi. And there's a lot, a lot of reasons as to why I love this author. If you have time, you just check out my channel for more. But going down River Road, which I can't even say it's second best or my third best, because all of his books are amazing. But this particular book is a very important book because it is set in Nairobi. 
And that is like back in the day because it was published in 1976. The story that uh, tells uh, about two young men, let me just say in the early 20s, and they don't have a job, like a very, a good paying job. And, you know, they are, they, they are caught up in a lot of tragedies in the city, you know, like the harsh conditions of the city where, you, where let's say you, you are not very well paid, you have to live in very harsh conditions. And, you know, a lot of issues involving the family, the government, uh, the workplace, because it's set, the main, the main setting of this book is like at a construction site where Ben meets Ochola and then they get to share a lot of tragedies together, like, you know, from moving um, from brothels to the drinking places, which is named like a Karara Center, you'll find that word in the book, and then to the workplaces where they meet different people. And uh, Ben, our main character, has a very special story because uh, at first he, he did not end up in a construction site he had a very good job as a lieutenant and he lo- he lost that job because he got involved with other people who you know who who lied to him about something that you're going to find out in the book so he got he lost that that job and it was a very very big loss for him so then later on he he resorted to go to a construction site which it has that place it, it carries a lot of a lot of uh, themes, lots about Nairobi life. If you would like to learn about Nairobi uh, during back in the day, you'll get to know more. You'll you'll meet humor. I don't know <laughs> pain at the same time. There's a lot of you know mixed up emotions in that oh. construction site. Yeah. So the main character is down on his luck. Is his name Ben? Yes. Yeah, the main character is Ben, and he's uh, kind of fallen on hard times. I've yeah. heard some of the reviewers on Goodreads describe it as a gritty novel. It's a tough mm-hmm. story. It is, it is. Is it uh, a lot of violence? Not really. Not violence, Not really, but just kind of the seedier side of, of life with people that are kind of down and out in Nairobi. Why do you love this book so much, Lexa? Major really writes about issues that people face. And as much as they're very harsh, he's very soft, you know, like his writing is really soft. He will make a very ugly scene look. I mean, it won't be so, so harsh to on your on your side, but you know, like in the spirit of you know, warning and teaching someone about what is really happening, he'll do it in a very polite way. So that's why I really, really love this book. And it is also really relatable till death because we've also read it in school. Uh I think people are still reading it in school. I read it in my second year of college. And so it's also a street named River Road. I saw some of the reviews talk about River Road is an actual road in Nairobi. Yeah. Yes. So it sounds like the compassionate writer. Would you say that? Yes. Yes. He makes you care about the characters. Yes. In some other books, you'd be like, "Oh, Major, you could have given Ben like a proper send off, or you could have gone easy on this author." But all in all, you'll know why he was so harsh on the on the, I mean, the character, or so soft on this character. So yeah. Interesting. Now, he uh, this was published in 1976. Uh, when was yes. the story set? A lot earlier or around the same time? I think around the same time. Around the same time. So it's kind of set in the 19, early 1970s Nairobi. And he is still around. Did, did I? I think I read that he lives in America now. So one thing about Major, he's super, I don't know, super private or silent. So yes, he's still alive. He's 72. But uh, his home, hometown is in Nanyuki, Nanyuki, Kenya. So I'm not really sure if he's in Kenya at the moment or in the US. Because okay. other than writing, he does film. So I don't yeah, know where he yeah. is at the moment. Yeah, he sounds like he's got a lot of 
He's got doing a lot of creative things. Well, I am looking forward to reading it. And uh, to those people watching, if you have trouble getting a paper copy, I was able to find e-copy that was not that, that expensive. I haven't that, uh, that I will be purchasing and reading it that way. So that sounds great. To finish, Alexa, tell us about the group read that you're doing. I managed, I can't believe I managed to get a paper copy in Japan of this collection of short stories. The other woman by Grace O'Gott. Yeah. So we'll just spend another minute or two about this one, but tell us about the author or the stories. All right. So Grace O'Gott was, uh, okay, how together with another Kenyan author were the first female authors be published in English in Kenya. And that was in the 1960s. So it was, it was a, it's a really interesting thing about Dress of God. And ever since, you know, like she published The Promised Land, which was her first novel. And then there was Land Without Thunder and Other Stories, which is also a collection of short stories. So she was very well known for her short stories, which are which are really timeless, like till date. People still read them in schools. So yeah, Grace Ogot is a very, very phenomenal woman, although she passed on in 2015, but her stories still live on. So this group read, we are going to read it as a collective, everyone. I had heard her name and I knew the names of one or two of her novels, but I feel very lucky that I could get a paper copy of this, your group read to participate. Is it me? It's no, it's definitely not new. It's it's a little bit worn, but uh, that it's the spine is in good shape and it's good enough condition for me, for for what I paid for it. So very much looking forward to it. So mm -hmm. Lexa, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you on the channel. I've bumped other guests to include you early so that mm -hmm. you so that we can get this out to get people involved in the Kenyan readathon. I mm -hmm. hope you'll come back and talk to me about another book another day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.